And you're gonna have uh, two hours back to back. Is that right? Yes. Think you can go two hours? I think so. This man could go forever. It's like you just push the button and boom, it just comes out. So we love you, brother. Oh. Amen. Well, thank you, Andrew and Jamie and Richard and Donna Harris. And um, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and get started. I do have a, a website, uh, it's my first slide of my PowerPoint, uh, if you're able to put it up there. And uh, so I send out a daily history email called AmericanMinute.com. And um, let me know when the PowerPoint's ready. Okay, there we go. And uh, so I spent a couple years just reading through every single century of recorded human history to find out what the most common form of government is. And it's kings, right? So you have Nimrod, Tower of Babel, uh, Gilgamesh, King of Uruk, Sargon of Acadia, 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, 5,000 years of Chinese emperors, uh, kings of Assyria, 7th century BC was the biggest empire on the planet. That's the one that took the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. Assyria is captured by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which is conquered by Cyrus of Persia. He's got the biggest empire around the fourth, fifth century BC. He's the one who let the Jews go back and rebuild the temple. Uh, and then Persia is conquered by Alexander the Great around 330 or so BC. It's the biggest empire that the planet Earth had ever seen. Uh, Chandra Gupta in India has got the biggest empire. Um, and then uh, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar has the biggest empire. Uh, matter of fact, Caesar wanted to have a worldwide tracking system. It was called the census. That was like new technology. If he could add 5G and cell phones and satellites, yeah, he would have used those. As the centuries go on, these kingdoms keep getting bigger because with military advancements, kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, they can kill with bronze weapon or iron weapon or phalanx spear, cemetery, sword, gunpowder. The weapon improves, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain killing Abel. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people. And then uh, you have the Askamite Empire in Africa. You have Attila the Hun, 450 AD, with an army of a half a million men wiping out cities across Europe. And then the Byzantine Empire, Justinian. And then Islam in the seventh century that begins to conquer from the uh, Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean, conquers all of Spain. And then Charlemagne, 800 AD, and he's the one who um, is controlled all of Europe. His grandfather was Charles Martel that stopped the Islamic invasion. And then you have the Vikings around 1000 AD, boats with low keels, they go up every river in Europe, they conquer, they've got the biggest empire. And then Genghis Khan, 1200 AD, he, he has, kills 30 million people from Korea to Hungary. Uh, it's the largest contiguous, which means land-connected empire in world history. His grandson is Kublai Khan that runs China. Uh, 1300s, you have Tamerlane, and he conquers all of Central Asia, kills another 17 million. And then uh, Russia, Ivan the Terrible, and uh, 12 time zones, it's enormous. And then uh, you cross to this hemisphere, the same thing's happening. And you have Montezuma, the head of the uh, Aztec Empire. And down in South America, Atahualpa, the head of the Inca Empire. And in, in the Inca Empire, everybody is a slave employee of the state. And, uh, and then you have the uh, King of Spain, 1500s, the largest empire the planet Earth had ever seen. They keep getting bigger and bigger. Anybody that can do plotting sees that at some point it's gonna max out on a global level. And Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. Every generation has a crisis, so the opportunity is, let's examine this. And so this is the Spanish Empire. Uh, the Philippines are named after King Philip of Spain. And uh, in the middle of this, you have um, kings deciding what's gonna be believed in their kingdom. What the king believed, the kingdom had to believe. Nebuchadnezzar blows the trumpets, you gotta bow to his statue. And then when the Reformation happens, you have kings having percentages of their populations becoming Protestant. And, and so you begin to have different kings, Protestant Catholics, beginning to persecute their populations if they didn't believe the way the king did. And so uh, you have uh, the Reformation starts 1517, Martin Luther. And in 1571, you got the Ottoman Empire. You have to, right, in the Islamic Empire, you have to believe in Islam or the Sultan might kill you. And, um, and so the King of Spain stops the Muslims on the Mediterranean. It's, it's called the Battle of Lepanto, biggest battle ever on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a pretty miraculous battle. Um, there's a 25-year-old Charles V of Spain, um, and, and he has a, or Charles V has an illegitimate son, Don John of Austria. And um, anyway, he's 25 years old, and you have this Muslim army, the largest navy ever assembled, 230 Muslim ships, powered by 15,000 Christian slaves under the deck rowing, right? So the Islamic Navy is powered by Christians as slaves rowing. And the wind is against 
the Holy League, uh, Don John of Austria, and it looks really bad. And the captains say, hey, let's fight another day. And um, uh, Don John says, no, we're here to fight. He gets everybody on deck. They pray the wind changes directions. And the Muslim sails go limp. The Holy League sails fill up and they collide. And uh, Don John of Austria kills and captures 200 of the 230 Muslim ships. It breaks the back of the Islamic Navy. And um, so as great as this victory is, instead of Spain going around freeing the Mediterranean up from Islamic control, the King of Spain decides he wants to stop the Reformation taking place in Holland and in England. And so you have Philip II of Spain sends the Iron Duke of Alba to Antwerp, Holland, and he kills 10,000 Protestants, leaves their bodies in the streets, and, uh, and then he sends his armada to smash the Reformation in England. Um, 1588, a hurricane helped destroy that. Uh, and then you got the Queen of France, Catherine de' Medici. The Medicis were a wealthy Florence family. And uh, now during this time, you have Catholics killing Protestants and Protestants killing Catholics. And Catholics killing Catholics, right? French Catholics, Spanish Catholics, and Protestants killing Protestants. Anglicans killing Puritans. There's a lot of killing going on in this century. We don't want to get back into trying to lay blame there. But we're trying to trace where America came from. And so here we have France, and we have a queen, Catherine de' Medici, and the, the king dies. So she's ruling France through a young son. And uh, she marries him to Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, and then after a couple of years, he dies, and she sends Mary, Queen of Scots, back to Scotland, where John Knox preaches to her. But anyway, so uh, Catherine de' Medici decides she wants to marry her daughter, Margaret, to the main Protestant leader, Henry of Navarre. Big wedding in Paris. A couple of days after the wedding, she has them pull chains across the streets so the carriages can't get out of town. And she sends her soldiers house to house and they kill 30,000 Protestant leaders. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And they throw their bodies in the Seine River and clog up the whole river. And so you have a question going on in Europe. What do you do with Romans chapter 13? Let everyone be subject to the governing authority for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities exist have been established by God. It's like, okay, we got these kings. You got good kings, you got bad kings, you sort of suffer under the bad ones. But what if the king literally has a mandate to kill your wife and kids? Are you supposed to obey? Okay, here are my wife and kids, you can kill them. And so in the French speaking area of Switzerland, you have a guy named John Calvin. And he begins to write things like this. When kings disobey God, they automatically abdicate their worldly power. He said, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. And so the Bible has a verse in Ephesians, children obey your parents. But what if there's a bad parent that tells their kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the kid supposed to obey the parent and do that? No, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent is telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the government as long as the government is telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. Amen. And this is exactly what Martin Luther King Jr. said in his letter from the Birmingham jail, 1963. One may advocate, how can you, or one may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. He goes on, one not only has a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that unjust law is no law at all. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. You obey the government as long as the government's telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. I mean, think of it. Why would God tell you to do something in his word and then tell you to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just told you to do? And so John Calvin, Switzerland, begins to develop how to have a government without a king. And it's called a covenant form of government. And... This is borrowed from ancient Israel, the first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. 
Now, you don't appreciate this period. It's called the Hebrew Republic from around 1400 B.C. to 1000 B.C. And this is the first time in recorded human history where you have a nation with millions of people and no king. Right? When you just read the Bible, you go, oh, the book of Judges look confusing, right? No, no. When you zoom out and say, look, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar, Maharaj, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Tilothan, it's all kings. And here you have this anomaly where you have Israel coming out of Egypt and for 400 years, no king. And it worked because every single citizen was taught the law. And every citizen was personally accountable to God to follow the law. Right? You're about to steal. Nobody's around. They think God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. Create something in your head called a conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. And so this covenant form of government was in Israel 400 years before King Saul. And the covenant form of government is you get blessings from God and you voluntarily be charitable and share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God, right? Socialism is where the government takes away your stuff and redistributes it to their friends. <laughs> no, this is where God entrusts you with stuff and it's yours and you can be moved upon to voluntarily give it and you're doing it as unto the Lord and you get rights from God and you're fair to your neighbor because you're accountable to God that says there's no respect to persons in judgment. So this covenant form of government was studied by John Calvin and the Calvinists, and um, it was unique in world history, right? And so um, this uh, is called the Hebrew Republic, and the Calvinist Puritan scholars that studied it were called Christian Hebraists. So you read it, you got Martin Luther starts the Reformation in 1517, and the Age of Enlightenment starts in the early 1600s, and so you really have a century where the scholars in Europe are not just thrilled they can read the Bible in their own language. They're studying this part of the Bible, the Hebrew Republic, this 400 year period without a king. James Harrington, John Sadler, whose sister Ann Sadler married John Harvard. And that's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. They're studying how to have a government without a king. Ancient Israel is our example. And so King Saul is the divider between England and America. You say, King Saul? So the kings of England looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the anointed King Saul and on period. The Calvinist Puritans looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the pre-King Saul period. All right, there's 400 years, no king. We each get rights from God. We get blessings from God. We voluntarily, we're fair with our neighbor, right? And so King Saul is the divider between the kings of England and in America, our experiment. Now, I mentioned this, but I'll get into it. So what would motivate you to follow this internal moral? You got all these people in America, they're all taught the law. And so all government in world history is somewhere on this line. One side is total government, the other side's no government. Pretty simple. Everybody hold up a fist in one hand and say concentrated power, concentrated power. Fingers apart with the other hand, say separated power, separated power. Now back to the fist, concentrated power, concentrated. That's world history. For most of world history, power is concentrated into these pharaohs and Caesars and Kaisers and sultans, and they rule through fear. It's very rare is the Tower of Babel scattered <laughs> and power's in the hands of the people. But in times of fear, they panic and let go of the rubber band and it snaps back. And so uh, this concept, if you take the power of the king and you stretch it, give it to the people, it would be anarchy. If you just give the power to the people, everybody's their own king, everybody does whatever they want, it's gonna be anarchy, unless everybody's taught the law. I was trying to think of a way of explaining it. Um, we all have GPS on our phone. Imagine if you could download a behavioral app that would tell you how to act in real time, <laughs> right? And, and it's monitoring your blood pressure and your voice volume when there's somebody in the close vicinity, it runs this little algorithm, you're about to lose your temper. And it sends you an alert, zzz, zzz, don't lose your temper. <laughs> and then it's monitoring your bank account, it's a little low, and then it's geoposition, sees you're in a store with expensive items and there's nobody in the vicinity, runs this algorithm, you're being tempted to steal, zzz, zzz, don't steal. Right, so imagine everybody downloads this behavioral app called The Law. Well, where do you get that app? Well, the Levite priests are the computer geeks that help you to download it, right? Line upon line, precept upon precept, Apple Store, Google Play, press this little button here, there, you know? 
So everybody in Israel downloaded this app called The Law, but the big question is why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Well, Israel had the key ingredient. There's a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair, and he's going to hold you accountable in the future, right? So again, you're about to steal, nobody's around, and God's watching me. He wants me to be fair, he's, he's gonna hold me accountable in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing, create something in your head called the conscience. If everybody believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police, and God knew the Israelites would sin. And so rather than anticipating some, I'm gonna get judged, once a year they had the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and the the sacrifice's blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat. Everyone's sins in the nation are forgiven for the past year. They all start the new year off with a clean slate. And obviously that is foreshadowing Jesus. He is our atonement. And you're forgiven not just for the past year, but for your entire life and for all eternity. And um, so the pilgrims, they studied this covenant form of government and they use the term congregational or assembly. They borrowed from Israel, the congregation of the Israelites, the assembly of the Israelites. And, um, uh, and that's where everybody is involved. It's a covenant. Matter of fact, the word federal, like federal government, the word federal is Latin for covenant. We have a covenant form of government. And so um, the, the Greek word, Jesus says, upon this rock I'll build my church. Well, the Greek word that he chose was ecclesia. Ek means out of, Ecclesia means a calling, Athens, 6,000 citizens, they would call them out of their market to the Agora, call them out of their homes to the Agora marketplace, and then they would decide what needs to be done and, and give out responsibilities. You gotta fix the Navy, you gotta get the walls, you gotta take care of the kids and everything. And so Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my ecclesia, my church, my body. It's the body of Christ, everybody has a part, an eye, an ear, a foot, right? And so in this church model, which is different than the Anglican model, the Anglican model is called uh, clergy laity. It's hierarchical. So you, um, uh, the, you have the king at the top and so forth, and I'll get into that. And so this is a congregational model. In the congregational model, the pastor helps everyone to have their own relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ that died on the cross to pay for their sins. And then the pastor coaches them to become mature Christians. Get in the habit of reading the Bible every day and read through the Bible and, and pray every day and plug into the body and do something. Because every thing that's alive takes in and gives out. For every muscle to grow, it has to be exercised. For you to grow in your Christian faith, you don't just hear a good sermon. You hear a good sermon and then you put yourself in a position where there's a need. And then the Holy Spirit will use you to meet the need, right? So you get somebody that's filled full of the Holy Spirit, filled full of the Word of God, you get them around somebody that has a need and the Holy Spirit will use it and help enlighten the Word and you will end up ministering to that person. And water seeks its own level, right? You get somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost around somebody with a need, it, it, and, and you've all been there, right? Where you're, you're witnessing and talking to somebody and counseling them, and you find yourself saying these really wise things. And you sort of think, hey, that was pretty good. I didn't know I was so smart. You're not. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, right? Enlightening the word, and, and as that water flows, it's bringing life to you. There's a friend of mine, Barry McGuire. He has the McGuire Car Wash, or what, Car Wax Company. And he witnesses all the time. And he was recently on Jack Hibbs' show. And, um, and he's like, you know what? It's only when you're letting the, the, whole, the water flow through you that it stays fresh. That if you're not sharing your faith, then it ends up getting stagnant and stale water, right? You have to keep it, you have to go out there and share for the, our Christian life to stay fresh. Anyway, so that's why I hated the COVID response so much because it was changing church government, right? So the hierarchical form of church government is um, clergy laity, the clergy does all the ministry and the laity is lazy and watches. <laughs> and your relationship with God, right in England, it was the King of England was the head of the Anglican church and then the Archbishop of Canterbury and Archbishop of York and the deaneries and vicars and curates and rectors and priests and it, your relationship is through this hierarchical structure. And, um, and the congregational model is what I just explained. The pastor has your own relationship with God and then he coaches you and then you plug into the body and do something. So the COVID response was what? Um, 
stop meeting together as a body and just listen to a sermon. It's like, okay, you're, you're taking in a really good sermon, but you can't give up. You know, you're at home. What are you going to witness to your pillow? You know, <laughs> no, you have to put yourself in a position, children's church, junior high, nursery, outreach. You have to do something to let that flow. So this is the, um, the king didn't like that. He demanded this hierarchical form of church structure. And, um, and so one of the early groups that, so they weren't just um, studying doctrine when they had the Reformation, they began studying alternative church structures. And so one of the first was the Baptists. And um, the, they founded the Baptist church in England. John Smith, not the Pocahontas one, this is a different. John Smith, Thomas Hellwise, John Merton. And look at the title of this book. It says, John Smith and the Separatist Baptist, uh, Thomas Hellwise, and the first Baptist church in England with fresh light upon the Pilgrim's Father Church. Why? Because the Pilgrim Church branched off of John Smith's Baptist Church. And so the early Baptists didn't believe the way the king did and they were put in the Newgate prison. They don't feed you in the Newgate prison. You have to have some friend that misses you and brings you food. And so here's John Merton who eventually dies in the Newgate prison. And a friend brings him a bottle of milk but instead of a cork, it had a wad of paper. And they don't give you anything to write with. It's not like, you know, Howard Johnson's with some nice letterhead in the drawer, right? Uh, so, so they're in prison and his friend brings him this bottle of milk and instead of a cork, it's a wad of paper. When the guard's not around, he unfolds the paper, takes a splinter, dips it in the milk and he writes out his pamphlets. It dries, it's clear. He folds it up, puts it in the empty bottle and guard takes it, friend takes it home, unfolds it and holds it above a candle and the heat of the candle turns the milk brown. And they can see what he wrote and they typeset it and print the pamphlets. And the uh, king's like, how's he getting that out of the prison cell, right? So the early Baptists call it the milk of the word because <laughs> he's writing it in milk. And, um, and so this is what he wrote while he was in prison. No man ought to be persecuted for his religion. Another, the practices of Christ and his disciples teaches no such thing as compelling men by persecution and afflictions to obey the gospel. And then another Baptist who dies in the Newgate prison is Thomas Hellwise. And he said, the king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them to set spiritual lords over them. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Neither may the king be judged between God and men. In other words, if the government can stand there on the day of judgment and answer for why you believe and did certain things, fine, believe and do whatever the government tells you to do. But if the government's not gonna be there, on the day of judgment, you are accountable to God for your own conscience. Kings didn't like that. They didn't want you having your own conscience. They want you to believe what they tell you to believe. And so these congregationalists began to be persecuted and they eventually, uh, the king said, I will make them conform themselves or else I will harry them out of the land. And so these pilgrim separatists flee to the Netherlands. They're there for 12 years. Spain threatens to attack. They flee again. They end up coming to the shores of America. They were gonna settle in Jamestown and submit to the king's government and say, well, we'd be 3,000 miles away so we can do our pilgrim stuff, but they get blown off course and they land in Cape Cod. And um, the captain uh, tries sailing south, but there's a storm. And off the coast of Cape Cod, it's um, really shallow. The sand goes out for you know a mile and 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. And so the pilgrim ship almost sinks in a storm. The captain goes back to Plymouth Rock and says, too dangerous to sail, everybody get off the boat. And the people say, well, we have a question. Who's gonna be in charge? We were gonna go to Jamestown and submit to the king's government. The whole world's ruled by kings. You gotta submit to a king. And, and you're telling us to get off and there's no king appointed person in our little group. Who's, who's gonna tell us what to do? They do something unique they give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And it says we, in the presence of God, do what? Covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic. So you have a church group that has a covenant form of church government, turning that into their civil government. Let me say that again. A church group forming itself into a political group. 
And um, now why did they do that? To enact just and equal laws and shall be thought most meet or necessary unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Instead of top down rule by kings through fear, it's bottom, bottom up rule just by us. In the womb of this Mayflower is conceived the child of self-government. And it's just 102 of us. Who's going to be in charge? There's just us. Well, there's 102 of us. We're going to covenant ourselves together. And we're going to pass laws and then submit to them. It's the difference between a dead pyramid top down and a living tree bottom up where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep this thing alive. Everybody needs to be a part of the body of Christ and everybody needs to be a part of the community, right? And it's, an, it's, it's taking the authority of the believer message and broadening it. So it's not just your life and your marriage and your family. It's as Richard said, it's broadening it to the community. And um, so it's the difference between divine right of kings, do this out of fear because I tell you to and I got a powerful army, and it's the difference between we the people. Now where did these pilgrims get their idea that they could rule themselves in this covenant form of government without a king? Their pastor, John Robinson. He was not a king appointed Anglican pastor. He was part of this Baptist congregational church from John Smith that he split away and turned into his church. And um, this painting, by the way, hangs in our US Capitol Rotunda in Washington, DC. And so this covenant form of government, again, you get blessings from God, you voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. Here's what pilgrim pastor John Robinson said. We are knit together as a body in covenant of the Lord tied to care for each other's good. Here is the Puritan founder of Massachusetts, John Winthrop. This love among Christians is a real thing, not imaginary, necessary to the being of the body of Christ. We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. So they're looking back to ancient Israel. And what are they doing? They're rejoicing together, they're laboring together, they're suffering together, right? And so you're caring for each other, not a socialist where the government's taking away your stuff, but it's voluntary. And so Margaret Thatcher of England, the founding fathers looked after one another as a matter of duty to their God. Oz Guinness said covenantal ideas in England were the lost cause, but they became the winning cause in New England. Covenant shaped constitutionalism. The American Constitution is a nationalized, secularized form of covenant. Covenant lies behind Constitution. Our government in America was borrowed from the church. America started as a church plant, a covenant form of government. And so the king turned up the heat and you got not just the pilgrims, but now 20,000 Puritans fled into New England. It's called the Great Puritan Migration. And you have a situation where you have pastors and their churches founding cities. And you have a pastor, John Lothrop, and his church founded a city, Barnstable, Massachusetts. A pastor, Roger Williams, and his church founded Providence, Rhode Island, and the First Baptist Church in America. A pastor, John Wheelwright, and his church founded Exeter, New Hampshire. And a pastor, Thomas Hooker, and his church founded Hartford, Connecticut. Again, this is unique on the planet at this time. You have Chinese emperors, Indian Maharajas, Muslim Sultans, Russian Tsars, African chieftains, kings of Spain, France, and Austria. Other than a little bit in Holland, the world is kings. And here in America, we got this little greenhouse experiment of pastors and their churches founding cities, taking their church government, congregational, everybody's involved, making it their community government. So let's look at, uh, this is 50 years before Europe's Age of Enlightenment. You go to a secular school, all oh, the fathers got their ideas from the Age of Enlightenment. No, the Age of Enlightenment came out of the, uh, the covenant, right? What's the Age of Enlightenment? So you have um, scientific revolution, and John, uh, Johannes Kepler discovering laws of planetary motion, and uh, Isaac Newton discovering laws of gravity, laws of optics, and Robert Boyle discovering laws of pressure, and you got all these laws being discovered. And so some theologians said, well, maybe God made everything with laws, and like a guy makes a complicated clock but goes off on a walk, God made everything, but, but he's not involved. He's distant, he's far removed, 
And so don't even bother praying. Things are, yeah, you made it, but it's just following these rules. And, uh, and so you go from the pilgrim covenant with a personal God to the age of enlightenment, social contract with a distant God. Next century, it's the French Revolution, which is social contract with no God. Next century, it's Marxism and socialism where the state is God, but that's a different talk. So um, you have the, the age of enlightenment. Well, this is 50 years before that. This is uh, these pilgrim separatists fleeing from the King of England. And you have Thomas Hooker and his church founding Hartford. And after they get there, the church members come to the pastor and say, pastor, can you preach a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? And so he gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid Firstly in the Free Consent of the People. This is reflected in our declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings in Europe did not ask the people for their consent. Can you imagine the king saying, oh, people, can, can I do this? No, they have an army, they're gonna make you do it. And so his sermon goes on, the privilege of election belongs to the people. This is reflected in our constitution, we the people. His sermon goes on, they who have the power to appoint officers and magistrates, it is in their power also to set the bounds and limitations of their power. So Calvin Coolidge said, Reverend Thomas Hooker of Connecticut, as early as 1638, said in a sermon before the general court, the foundation of authority is laid firstly in the free consent of the people. This doctrine found wide acceptance among the nonconformist clergy who later made up the congregational church. And so Thomas Hooker's sermon is written down. It becomes the Constitution of Connecticut called the Fundamental Orders and it's used from 1639 up until 1818. Connecticut is using Pastor Thomas Hooker's sermon as its constitution. Historian John Fisk calls it the first written constitution in history. It becomes a blueprint for the New England colonies and eventually the U.S. Constitution. And so that's why Connecticut's called the Constitution State. And um, so here's a plaque in England, Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Another plaque in England, Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. A statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible on the state capitol grounds in Hartford. At the base, it says, leading his people through the wilderness. On this site, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Here's another plaque. It says, here minister Thomas Hooker, a peerless leader in New England thought and life in both church and state, right? He's a minister and he's speaking on church stuff and state stuff. Here's another plaque, Thomas Hooker, a leader, preacher, a statesman who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. This is revolutionary that you don't appreciate until you zoom out and look at 6,000 years and you see Nimrods and Pharaohs and Caesars and Kaisers and Sultans and Tsars. It's all top down, kings ruling through fear. And here you have this experiment that they borrowed from their church government and it's the people get to give consent. And another plaque in Hartford, it says, near this site, May 31st, 1638, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people, and then the people adopt it as the fundamental orders. And so what does the fundamental order say? The people conjoin ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Well, who are the people? It's the pastor, Thomas Hooker, and his church. So again, you have a church group forming itself into a public state very similar to the Mayflower Compact, a church group covenanting itself into a civil body politic. Now, why did they do this? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. They picked the form of government that would best preserve the preaching of the gospel. Here's another plaque, lots of plaques there. It says, um, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you grasp the significance of this? Covenant church government, everybody's involved. Community government, everybody's involved. U.S. Constitution, it's we the people. And so in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. How can you say pastor don't preach on politics? When it's the pastor's sermon, that's their constitution. How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were like no non-church members to be lazy and let them run stuff. 
And so the word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. Indianapolis, Minneapolis, polis means city. And politics is simply the business of the city. And all there was in the city of Hartford was the church. They had one building called the meeting house. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible. And that's where they would gather together and do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. That's where the rabbi would teach the law. And that's where they would get together and do their city business. I mean, why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so when the Revolutionary War starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. Democracy too prevalent in America. We don't need the people meeting and giving their consent to stuff. You just obey government mandates. Simple. You're a robot. You're a zombie. The government gives a mandate. You just blindly obey. We don't want your consent. And so, Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. I have a question for you. The way America's founders set it up, who is the ultimate governing authority in America? It's we the people, right? It's a cover. We give our consent. We're the authority. The politicians are the ones that we put in place to carry out our will. You hire them, you fire them, right? It would be silly for a king to have to obey his servants, right? Imagine a king in his castle and the janitor says, you can't go in this part of the castle anymore, king. It's off limits to you. It's like, who are you? Well, I'm the janitor. It's like, where'd you come from? Oh, the cook and the butler hired me. Well, <laughs> they're my servants, so you're like a servant of a servant. I mean, who are the Supreme Court justices? Well, they're, they're appointed by the, you know, the president, confirmed by the Senate. Well, I elect the president in the Senate. So the Supreme Court justices are like servants of servants. And you're like, uh, yeah, yeah, but still, the, we're going to change marriage forever. We're going to change life and, and the womb, all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, wait a second. We're, we, the people, are the king, right? So kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. Democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-sovereign, co-ruler, co-king. Um, what's the difference between democracy and republic? Uh, democracy, demos means people, krasi means rule. Athens, they had 6,000 citizens. And every citizen had to be at every meeting every day to talk about every issue. Totally time consuming. And you physically had to be there so they couldn't get any larger than a city. So they were called city states. And if you didn't keep up in, with what they're talking about today, you're called an idiotus. <laughs> and you didn't know what we're talking about today. Every day you had to keep up. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Now, a republic is where you take care of your family and your farm and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day and talks politics. They are your representative. So republics could get bigger. And so the easy way to remember is the word republic begins with R-E-P and the word representative begins with R-E-P. So a republican form of government is a representative form of government. But both of those forms of government, the citizen is the king. One, the citizen has to personally be there and the other, the citizen is ruling through their representative. And so democracies and republics are where the citizens are king. And so uh, when we pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic, we're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. And so when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system where I participate in ruling myself. It's like, okay, somebody else will tell you what to do. So here's Lincoln. He says, the people of these United States are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts, right? So the people are the masters. And I love this quote, Grover Cleveland, the sovereignty of 60 millions of free people is the working out of the divine right of man to govern himself. A manifestation of God's plan concerning the human race. We all get to rule ourselves. Calvin Coolidge, the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. They, in order that they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. America's form of government was birthed out of the church form of government, which was birthed out of ancient Israel, this idea of everybody being involved to covenant with us and God without a king. So this is what was taught in New England. And these Calvinist Puritans were nicknamed old lights. Everybody say old lights. And after a century, it got a little dry. And they were so plan focused that David Brainerd got expelled from Yale because he said his professor was as spiritual as a chair. 
And Yale reprimanded their students because they were going into town and not having drunken brawls and smashing windows and setting things on fire. No, no, they were accosting people and meeting them on the street and presenting, the, confronting them with the gospel. The students were going in witnessing in town and, that, and Yale considered an embarrassment that their students are, are like going up to strangers and telling them about the gospel. And so they reprimanded the students. And that plan concept got to the extreme was that God even planned who goes to heaven and who doesn't. So don't even bother evangelizing because it's all, it's, it's case sera, sera, what, you know, it's fates like Islamic fates. Whatever happens is gonna, right? And so these old lights got dry. And so then you had the new lights. Now, these are these pietist Lutherans that come over and they begin to talk about, influence other denominations. And these new lights said, no, it's more than a plan. It's a great plan. We get to rule ourselves without a king, but it's more than a plan. You have to have an experience with Jesus. And so let's take this apart. So in 1517, Martin Luther starts the Reformation because he had a personal revelation that just shall live by faith. It was so personal that he was willing to stand up to the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor and say, unless you can prove me wrong from scripture, here I stand, so help me God. Very personal to Martin Luther. But some German princes want to break away from Rome. And they go, this is my chance. Kingdom of mine, I just decided you're all Lutherans. And the people say, okay, oh, we're Lutheran. No, what do we believe? And so for the people in the kingdom, it's not the same personal experience Martin Luther had. It's just a new state doctrine. A little more scriptural emphasis, but it's a new state doctrine. And, and a, a movement starts called pietism that said, look, being a Christian is more than state doctrine. You have to have an experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change. And you won't do the worldly things you used to do, like go to bars and brothels and go to lewd theater and get involved in worldly government. Wait, what was that last thing? Yeah, government's filled full of worldly people. If you're really a Christian, you won't be involved. Well, wait a second. The Calvinist Puritan said, hey, we got a plan. If we all get involved in a covenant, we can all rule ourselves without a king. So we all got to be involved. We're citizens. We're co-kings. But these pietist revivalists said, no, 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 no. Don't get involved. It's worldly. And um, this turned into the German concept of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church, the two don't touch. And there were even German princes that would donate money to the pietists so they would teach their people not to get involved in the prince's business. Here's a little more money, tell your people to stay out of my hair, right? And so four centuries of this allowed Hitler to put Jews on train cars and they're going past the churches crying out for help. And the church's response was, well, that's the government doing that. We're the church and the government circle church. We, we can't so, so let's just sing praise songs to Jesus louder while these Jews are screaming, crying out for help. Can anybody see there's something wrong with that picture? And so you have, again, recapping Calvinist Puritans. Great. We have a plan to rule ourselves without a king. Comes from the Bible, ancient Israel. We all got to be involved. Gets a little spiritually dry because it's so plan focused. Pietist Lutherans, early 1700s. It's their new lights. It's more than a plan. You have to have this personal experience. And it has some emotion to it, which is great because we're emotional creatures. But the answer is it's a withdrawal. It's not only a personal experience with Jesus, it's only a personal experience with Jesus. And they would pull out and withdraw from being involved. And so there's a ditch on either side of the road. And so again, just to lay this out, Calvinist Puritans, good, they have a plan to rule ourselves without a king. Bad, so plan focused, it becomes rigid, formal, spiritually dry. Lutheran pietists, good, have a personal relationship with Jesus. Bad, it's so personal, it's only personal, and you withdraw from being involved. And so I have to give credit where credit's due. These Lutheran pietists did emphasize a personal experience with Jesus. And one of them is Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. And he is in a little area of Germany bordering the Czech Republic. It's called Moravia. Uh, his dad dies, he's in a, his parents die, and he's raised by a grandmother who's a pietist Lutheran. And she uh, raises him, now he's 19, and he's royalty, and so he's gonna go on his grand tour to all the different courts of Europe, meet all the who's who and the lobbyists, and he's in Dusseldorf, and he, um, 
uh, and his free time goes to the museum, sees a painting of Christ with a crown of thorns. And it's one of those paintings where Jesus is looking at you. So no matter where you're at, look at the painting he's looking at you at. And, and it says, underneath all this I have done for you, what are you doing for me? And that, that makes an impression on this young 19 year old guy. Goes back to his estate in Moravia and he decides he's gonna open it up for these persecuted Christians ac across Europe to come and live on his farm and not be persecuted. And so they all show up and uh, it's great for a little while, but guess what? Then they start bickering with, he with each other over doctrine. And so the thing's about to fall apart and he decides to leave his nice palace, come and live with them. And he decides they need to have a communion service. They need to forgive each other. And they do, they pray. And then they pray all night, all day, all night. Then they're taking turns with the kids and the food and the farm and they, keep, they pray all week, all month, all year. That prayer meeting went on uninterrupted for over 100 years. And this little group of German Lutheran pietists called Moravians send missionaries around the world. The first ones heard about the slaves on the Danish island of St. Thomas and the slaves were being, being treated really bad and they weren't being taught the gospel. And so these the two Moravian guys go to Copenhagen in Denmark and say, we want to go over there to minister the gospel to these slaves. And they said, how are you going to support yourself? And they said, we're willing to sell ourselves into slavery in order to have an opportunity to minister to the slaves. They come over there. The one was a carpenter, so they didn't have to sell themselves, but they're living amongst the slaves and they're presenting the gospel. And, and then this impacts these other Moravians. And they decide that they were going to go to India and to Egypt and to Iceland. And they start setting themselves in the next 20 years, they send out more missionaries than all of Christendom did in the previous 200. And they're not supported by any missionary sending society. They're not getting checks in the mail. It's just a young couple that says, hey, we feel like we're supposed to go to Suriname. And they just show up and they learn the language and they learn how to make a living and, and they work really, really hard, two and three jobs, and then they end up ministering on the side and starting a revival. And, and they do it, they have a world, imagine all the woke energy that young people have. Instead of smashing things and tearing them down, they're risking their lives to spread the gospel all around the world. And so they're going to South Africa and South America and Guyana and all these different places, Tanzania and, and uh, the Congo and Georgia. And they're on a boat going to this brand new colony of Georgia and on the boat are the Wesleys. And the boat's in a storm, nearly sinks. John Wesley said, the waves were like mountains. We thought we were shoved to the bottom of the ocean. And Wesleys are panicking and they go to where the Moravians are. And they're just singing praise songs to Jesus. And John Wesley's like, uh, you, ha you guys have a personal experience with Jesus that I don't have, right? The Moravians, a personal experience with Jesus, right? And, uh, and so John Wesley's just like an Anglican and he was part of the Holy Club at Oxford. And they were legalistic to the extreme. And they were like, you know, encouraging other and being real legalistic. And so the, he comes, he's the first Anglican minister to Georgia and he is like legalistic and nobody wants that. And so he ends up failing. He goes back to England and he and his brother meet another Moravian who invites them to one of their prayer meetings. And it's one of those Moravian all night prayer meetings. And, um, uh, John Wesley writes, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's epistle, preface to the epistle of the Romans, and about a, a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So he had a personal experience with Jesus. And what did he do? He goes over and lives with the Moravians over there at Heron Hut, right next to the Czech Republic for eight months. And John Wesley calls it the religion of the heart. And then he comes back to England and he starts a revival movement inside of the Anglican church called Methodism. They say, look, it's more than doctrine. You have to have that experience with Jesus. And uh, he gets his friend George Whitfield involved. And George Whitfield takes us to America, preaches seven times up and down the colony, saying it's more than doctrine, you have to have an experience with Jesus. And he has crowds, and Ben Franklin prints all of his sermons. He has crowds of 20,000 people speaking without a microphone. Could you imagine that? So this is a great revival. So we want to give these pietist Lutherans credit for helping to spread it. It affects all these other denominations. And, um, but what was the byproduct? The byproduct was 
you have a personal experience, but it's only personal and you're gonna withdraw. So let's look. The founding father of the Lutheran Church in America is Henry Muhlenberg. He's a pietist and he has two sons, John Peter Muhlenberg and Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg and their pietist pastors don't get involved and John Peter hears Patrick Henry give his give me liberty, give me death speech. And he goes to George Washington who was there and says, I wanna help. And George Washington says, fine, I'm gonna make you a colonel, go get your men. So he goes back to his church and he preaches a sermon out of Ecclesiastes. There's a time for all things, a time to scatter stones, a time to collect stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to preach and a time to fight. And he takes off his black clerical robe and underneath he has a uniform of a continental officer. And he has an altar call. And 300 men of his church and the half dozen surrounding churches kiss their wives goodbye, right off to become the 8th Virginia Regiment. They fight in all these battles, including Yorktown. After the war, he's elected to Congress. And he is a congressman in the first session of the U.S. Congress. Such an important guy, they have his statue in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall with his black clerical robe coming off in his uniform. And his brother, Frederick Augustus, is a pietist, don't get involved pastor in New York. He writes a letter to John Peter saying, you have become too involved in matters which as a preacher you have nothing whatsoever to do. John Peter writes back to Frederick and accuses him of being a Tory British sympathizer. <laughs> Frederick writes back and says he cannot serve two masters, right? There's the kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church, the two don't touch. And, and then the British invade New York and they burn Frederick's church. And then he decides maybe we do need to get involved. <laughs> and then he's elected to Congress and he's elected the first speaker of the House. The first speaker of the US House of Representatives is Lutheran pastor, pietist turned getting involved, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. And who else is in that first session of Congress? His brother, John Peter Muhlenberg. And what did they pass in that first session of Congress? The First Amendment. The first 10 amendments, right? And what, does anybody honestly believe that these two pastors would vote to outlaw themselves? <laughs> would they say pastors aren't supposed to be involved in politics even though we are pastors and we are involved? No, the First Amendment as well as the first 10 amendments were handcuffs on the federal government to keep it from becoming a big centralized Frankenstein like King George III was, forcing everybody to believe what he tells them to believe through mandates. So, Calvinist Puritans, 1600s, great, we have a plan that we can rule ourselves without uh, a king. And then the 1700s, these pietists, Lutherans, that says it's more than a plan, you have to have this personal experience. There is a middle of the road. And the middle of the road is, yes, it is a personal experience with Jesus. But we wanna be involved so our kids can have a chance to have a personal experience with Jesus. Right? You want to leave a nation to your kids where your kids get a chance to hear the gospel. Because if you don't get involved and they push the trans agenda, it not only says there is no God, if there is a God, he is so messed up, he's put in men and women's bodies and you have to have operations and infections and drugs and diapers and all that kind of stuff for the rest of your life because he's a messed up God? And if, that, if sex outside of marriage is not sin, arguably there are no sins. And if there's no sins, you don't need a savior. And so they are outlawing the gospel. They're pushing an anti-Christian gospel. They're pushing in a gospel of antichrist in the schools. And if you do not get involved, this is what they're gonna be teaching, right? So if you really believe that Christianity is a personal experience with Jesus, you will be involved wanting to preserve a country where your kids get a chance to have a personal experience with Jesus. The most important thing is to bring people to Christ. The second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. <laughs> and um, so, we talked about the Calvinist Puritan 1600s the Lutheran Pietist 1700s, and now the early 1800s. You have the Second Great Awakening Revival. It's wonderful, all kinds of preaching, and, um, but what happens? You have millennialists. You now what's millennialists? That's this awakening that Jesus is really going to return and set up his millennial thousand year kingdom right here on planet Earth. 
right? During the revolution, everybody's, you know, talking about other things, but all of a sudden, he's really gonna come back. And so you had this millennialism, this thrill that Jesus is gonna come back. And of course, you have different the doctrines developed, the pre-trib, the post-trib, the, 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 the mid-trib, all that. But nevertheless, it's this anticipation, Jesus is really gonna come back. And there are two responses to this. One response is get busy and do something so that when he returns, he'll find you working. And this birthed a world missionary movement. We're sending missionaries to Burma and missionaries to Hawaii. And, missionaries, and it sparked the, the, uh, the American Bible Society and all kinds of stuff. And the abolitionist movement came out of that, right? You're going to do something. But then there was another group that says, oh, do nothing. Be silent. And Jesus, it's messy down here. Hurry up and come and take me out of this mess. So again, it's the devil's attitude is if you can't beat him, join him, right? If you can't stop a movement of God, get in it and, and, and sidetrack it. And so the uh, idea is it's great. We have a movement from God. Well, we can rule ourselves without a king. Well, great, let's make it so, so planned focused it becomes dry and dead. No, we've got a movement of God. It's a personal experience with Jesus. Okay, we're gonna say it's only a personal experience or you're not gonna be involved. Now, Jesus is gonna come back. Oh, it's so exciting. Let's get busy, do something. No, 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 don't, don't do anything. Jesus, hurry up and take, take me out of this mess. And so I have a question. Is it holier to be silent? You, you meet people. Um, we only preach the gospel, brother. We don't get involved in politics. Um, I'm a little more spiritual than you are because I'm not involved. You're still in the worldly realm and you're doing all that. But I'm, I'm, I'm a little more spiritually advanced because I'm just focusing on uh, myself and, and the gospel and my personal relationship with God. And, well, I have a question for those type of people. Is it holier for you not to be involved? What do you do with Numbers chapter 30? It's the silence equals consent chapter in the Bible. A half a dozen scenarios. One is if a daughter is still living in her father's house and binds herself with a vow. In the day the father hears it, if the father is silent and he holds his peace, her vows stand. But if the father overrules her in the day that he hears of her vows, then none of her vows shall stand and the Lord releases her. That's come down to us as vows in a wedding ceremony. And the pastor tells the church members, if you're silent, you're giving consent to the wedding vows, just like if the dad is silent and her vows stand, so your silence gives consent. Well, I have a, so, so it's a book of common prayer. If anyone present knows of any reason why this couple shall not be joined together in holy matrimony, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're holding your peace, you're giving consent. It's called the rule of tacit admission. It's in Black's Law Dictionary, an admission reasonably inferable from a party's failure to act or speak, right? So it's in law, tacit criminal admissions. And um, so if your silence gives consent to wedding vows, it gives consent to other things. And if they're killing babies in your community and you're silent, you are giving consent to killing babies, right? And if you give consent to sin, you're gonna share in the guilt of the sin and you're gonna share in the judgment of the sin. Here's a verse, Leviticus 20. Any Israelite or foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Molech is to be put to death. If the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, I myself will set my face against him and his family and cut them off from their people together. All you have to do is close your eyes while they're killing the kid and you are guilty. So in California, they actually passed, they, were, they had a bill to kill a baby up to 28 days after birth. And enough pastors in California says, I can't close my eyes to this. And they go to Sacramento and they pressure them, right? And it was white pastors, black pastors, Hispanic pastors, Asian pastors, right? They all show up and they pressure them and they, they rewrote the bill. Now it's still a bad bill, but they took that part out. Proverbs 24, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand back and let them die. Don't disclaim responsibility, but say, I didn't know about it. It says, for God who knows all hearts, knows yours and he knows you knew. And he will repay everyone according to his deeds. So the apostle Paul, Acts 22, talking to the Lord, he says, and when the blood of thy, thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Paul did not throw a stone, he did not say a word, yet he knew by simply standing there silent while they were killing Paul, he was guilty for the death of Paul. 
Mordecai goes to Queen Esther, says there's a mandate from the government to kill the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Here's one, Numbers 20. Moses and Aaron are called unto the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord spake to Moses, take the rod, gather the assembly, thou and Aaron, speak to the rock, and it shall give forth water. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out. End of the chapter, the Lord spake to Moses, Aaron will not enter the land because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. It's like, both? I just read the chapter. Aaron didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. Yeah, that's just it. Two people were called to the door of the tabernacle, Moses and Aaron. Aaron heard God tell Moses, speak to the rock. When Moses lifted up the rod the first time and hit the rock, it probably took Aaron by surprise. When Moses lifted up the rod the second time, Aaron knew what was coming and he was silent. He didn't protest. He didn't say, well, Moses, I I was there. I heard God tell you, speak to the rock. Well, hold it. No, Aaron was silent. And in that instant, he was guilty. Moses's was a sin of commission. Aaron's was a sin of omission. The first hitting of the rock, that was Moses' sin of commission. The second hitting of the rock with Aaron silent was Aaron's sin of omission. Another one of those is King Jehoiakim, wicked king. And he has Jeremiah's scroll taken to him and he has Jehudi read it in the ears of the king and all the princes and the king's in his winter palace and has a fire burning before him. And whenever Jehudi read three or four columns of Jeremiah's scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them in the fire. Yet the princes showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes, nor did the servants. They stood there watching the king take Jeremiah's prophecy and burn it. They were silent. And you can tell from the context that they were guilty. They were just as guilty as the king because they were watching him doing it and they weren't. And then you see these other guys, El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll. At least they spoke up. Aaron didn't speak up, but they spoke up. Here's an interesting one, Leviticus 5. When a person sins because he did not speak up, even though he was an eyewitness to a case and knew what happened, anyone who failed to testify, he is guilty. Another translation, when a person sins in that he hears the utterance of a curse swearing and he is a witness and he does not make it known, then he bears his guilt. And then there's a commentary and it says, if you hear someone cursing, taking God's name in vain and you're silent, it's as if you took God's name in vain. That even convicts me. How many times have we heard that? I was talking to Alex McFarlane last night And he was saying how he was someplace and there was this big guy and he was yelling at his wife, taking God's name in vain. And Alex like couldn't take it anymore. And he goes over there and says, excuse me, sir, um, you're you're taking God's name in vain. And God says that he will not uh, overlook that and, and you need to ask forgiveness. And he says, this big guy sort of shrunk and hung his head and says, you're right. (laughs) You know, the movie, uh, Indiana Jones, there's a scene in there where uh, Harrison Ford takes God's name in vain. And um, you know, it says, whoso is partner with a thief hateth his own soul. He heareth cursing and bereath it not. And so here's this uh, short little scene. Jesus Christ. That's the blasphemy. It wasn't but a generation ago that people wouldn't put up with that. They heareth cursing and berayeth it not. Well, we need to berayeth it. And um, so Leviticus 19, 17, it is wrong not to correct somebody who needs correcting. Uh, So you got Samuel, it says, and the Lord said to Samuel, I will carry out against Eli everything that I've spoken because his sons blasphemed God and he did not restrain them. He was doing the sin of omission. Martin Luther King Jr., he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting it 
is really cooperating with it. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. During World War II, you had the German concept of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church, the government's killing Jews, the church is silent, and there's somebody that can't be silent anymore. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And so he starts the Confessing Church Movement. And he says, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Matter of fact, the word Protestant comes from the word protest, <laughs> right? You have these people that says, I can't be silent. I gotta speak out. Now we all know this verse, Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know the verse right before that? Confront your neighbor directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. You're loving your neighbor, loving your neighbor, but they're confronting each other. Another translation, rebuke your neighbor directly so you will not incur guilt because of him. They're loving each other, but they're rebuking each other. New Testament, if your brother sin, rebuke him. Ecclesiastes, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than the song of fools. Proverbs, he that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. Revelation, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Hebrews, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For, the, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke. Titus 2, 14, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. 1 Timothy 5, 20, let them that sin rebuke before all. And uh, there are many unruly and vain talkers who subvert whole households, wherefore rebuke them sharply. This is a part of the gospel that we haven't heard very much. And um, now I'm glad they put this verse in there. Paul, rebuke not an elder, <laughs> but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. And so, so uh, you can rebuke in love. I believe that we were rebuked last night by Andrew saying that some of the people that, uh, like that one guy that says, oh, the Lord told me to go to Karis and what I got all this other stuff and stuff. And he said, well, you lost me when you said the Lord told you to come here and you didn't, right? That was a, a, a root, but he did the rebuke in love. So you can rebuke in love, but I like this verse, rebuke not an elder, but entreat. What's entreat? It's a petitioning, a pleading. You, you're still not silent. It doesn't say ignore, you're not silent. You're, you're saying something, but you're saying it respectfully. So the woke. The woke have a tactic, and the tactic is to guilt trip Christians into being more Christian than Christ. You think, what? Yeah, they say, if you're really a Christian, you will be silent while we teach your kids something that Jesus would never teach. Right? Would Jesus teach the, the trans agenda? No. 72 different genders, you can feel different every day. No, Jesus said, in the beginning, God made them male and female. Right? These precious little boys and girls that are made in God's image, and yet they're telling you if you're really, Christians are, are, are tolerant. Christians will stay silent. They're, matter of fact, they're like wet cardboard. You can kill a baby in front of a Christian, they won't do anything. They're just, they're, they're, they don't stand for anything. Watch, we'll even teach them an anti-Christian gospel and, and make them think that by following Christ, you have to be silent and tolerate it while we teach your kids anti-Christian gospel. We can teach the kids the religion of the Antichrist, but the Christians have to tolerate us. So if you know schools are teaching an anti-Christian sexual views different than what Jesus taught, and you are silent, just waiting for Jesus' return, you're actually giving consent to their teaching of that stuff. And Jesus says, if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it will be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. It's gonna be a rude awakening. <laughs> it's gonna be a rude awakening when church members who think they're being spiritual by not getting involved, when they realize by their silence, they're giving consent to sin. They're inviting the judgment of God upon their heads. All these woke churches, oh, we're not involved, we're gonna be silent, we're gonna be silent. You're giving consent to all that stuff. And if you give consent to sin, you are participating in it, 
you're going to share in the judgment of it. Now, a scriptural case can be made that God cares about children, and he cares about what little children are being taught. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children. We're supposed to care about what kind of inheritance and what kind of country we're leaving to our kids. And so the answer is local, local, local. You know, um, if churches can just be concerned about what's being taught to their children in the local schools, all the higher races will take care of themselves. The people that feel called to run for a higher position, they'll have learned how it all works. If churches can just take responsibility for what's being taught to kids. There's more people that go to church than vote in a school board election. Right? I ran for Congress three times. I raised millions of dollars. Right? I had the top three members of the U.S. Congress come in and campaign for me. We had Chuck Norris doing commercials, Ted Nugent, Pat Boone, Art Linkletter, Zig Ziglar, James Dobson, Alan Keyes, Judge Roy Moore, Phyllis Schlafly. It was a big deal. You tell that to most people, they're like, check that off my list. I'll never do it. It's like, forget national races. You drive by that school every day. And you know they're teaching something different than what Jesus has taught. And if you're silent, you're giving consent to something that Jesus would never teach. And more people go to church than vote in a school board. Like, just pick some mama bear and tell all the churches, let's get behind her. Like, pick some guy that cares about what his kids are being taught. We can begin to turn this thing around. And then there's this thought. The more power concentrates into fewer hands globally, God's counterbalance is to have more people involved locally. Right? So we see in power concentrating, World Economic Forum, all that. Yeah, it's concentrating in the fewer hands globally. God's counterbalance get more people involved locally. Now, maybe God's letting the evil be exposed to expose the condition of your heart. Now, what are you talking about? Maybe God wants to see how much you can stomach. I mean, how much will you put up with? What will it take to get you to do something? If you can stand by giving consent to evil, what does that say about your heart? It says in the last days, because evil shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Ezekiel is given a vision by the Lord. He's taken to Jerusalem, sees all the wicked stuff. And he cried, cause them that have the charge over the city to draw near. Behold, six men came, every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry over the abominations done within it. To the others, he said, go after him through the city, slay old and young, but do not come near anyone who has the mark and begin at my sanctuary. What's the difference between being slain and not? Does your heart sigh and cry over the abominations done in the city? I walked in here the sanctuary and there's a couple with the little kids and I thought, how beautiful. We have the children's ministry, how beautiful, the little children, right? We care about the children. But for somebody to say, Please go ahead and let these kids be taught lies and permanently mutilate their body. Kim Walker Smith sings a version of the song, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And she's got the little kids in a choir behind her and it's just the most touching song. And there's a verse in there that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for the kingdom's cause. Do you think it breaks Jesus' heart that these little kids made in God's image, right, are being chemically castrated because they spent, uh, you know, time playing with their sister's dolls? Or sex trafficking of kids. This movie that Jim Caviezel, Sound of Freedom, that's coming out this 4th of July week about how America is the biggest place for sex trafficked kids. And if you're, do you think Jesus's heart breaks for these little innocent kids? And for churches to sit back and say, we're not gonna get involved, we're, we're holier. They have a 900% increase in trans identifying kids in uh, these public school systems in the Washington DC suburbs. 900% in the last two years. What do they do? They, they do the pyramid of oppression. And at the top are the cisgendered. Those are people that believe there's a male and a female. They're the oppressors. Everybody else is being oppressed by those people at the top. They go into the classrooms. They say, you know, these are the bad people. And everybody else is down here. And these, none of these little kids want to be the bad person. And so they're like, well, I'm a, um, a intersexual. I'm bisexual. I'm transsexual. I'm anything sexual. But I'm not that because they're the bad people. It's a psychological trick they're doing. I mean, they could put... Uh, you know, anybody at the top of the pyramid. They could put gr green-eyed people. They're the bad people. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to be a green-eyed person. 
Little kids just want approval of the authority figure, acceptance by their friends, and they're manipulating that to push this agenda, and they've had a 900%. In the last two years, how, how much longer are we gonna sit back? The same spirit that mutilates them inside the womb with abortion now wants to mutilate them outside the womb with the trans agenda. They wanna, and they wanna blame you for it, right? They wanna blame you, say it's your intolerance that are causing these trans students to become suicidal. Yet statistics shows it's the teaching of the trans agenda that makes these kids suicidal and homicidal. They wanna, it's called psychological projection. They blame you for what they're guilty of. And it's in the Bible. Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of lusting after her when she was lusting after him. They accuse you of being intolerant when they're intolerant. They accuse you of being hateful when they're hateful. They accuse you of being bigots and everything and divisive, and when yet they are. And um, so in the last days, the backslidden church will be silent and allowing an anti-biblical sexual agenda. What did God, Jesus say to the church of Thyatira? He says, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are blazing fire. I have a few things against thee. Thou sufferest, thou tolerate that woman Jezebel to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication. There will be in the last days churches that are silent with the teaching of an immoral sexual. And as Richard said, those, that, uh, love, uh, those who love the Lord hate evil. And Jesus says, uh, you will take heat for being like Jesus and you'll be hated for all men by all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. Now what's the best thing you have in your life? Riches or whatever, no, it's your name. So it's good names to be chosen rather than great riches. So if you're gonna give all for Jesus, that means you gotta give your name. You gotta be willing to have people say bad things about your name. You can't be afraid of them posting something bad on the internet about you. Oh, I'm gonna, no, you gotta say, I'm gonna give it all for Jesus. And even the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who made himself of no reputation. All these people, I don't want someone to pay, right? Be not afraid of their faces. I thought this was interesting. Um, Matthew. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? They say, some said thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say uh, Jeremiah. And of course he says, who do you say I am? And they say, well, I'm, you're, you're the Christ. But let's look at this. Who is John the Baptist? He stood up to the corrupt king ah uh, uh, Herod, right? John the Baptist stood up to Herod. Who was Elijah? He stood up to the corrupt king Ahab. And who was Jeremiah? He stood up to the corrupt king Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. In other words, Jesus was standing up to corruption. You know, you think of it, Jesus didn't pet lambs all day long, <laughs> right? His, his first sermon ended with them wanting to push him off a cliff, right? And they were filled with wrath, thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill, they about to throw him down on the cliff. Another sermon ends. They took up stones to throw at him. How many of you had sermons end like that? And, uh, and then he's invited to somebody's house for dinner. And the Pharisees uh, marveled that Jesus had not first washed his hands. And Jesus says, you Pharisees uh, make clean the outside of the cup, but on the inward parts are full of raven and wickedness. You fools, he that made the without, made that which within. And warned you Pharisees, you tithe mint and rue and pass over judgment and so forth. Warned you Pharisees, you love the uppermost seats in the synagogue, greeting hypocrites. You're like graves which appear not and that the men walk over them. And, and then the, the lawyer pipes up. Master, by saying thus, thou reproaches us also. And he says, woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for you laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and you yourselves touched not one of the burdens with your fingers, and woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken the key of knowledge and entered in not yourselves, and uh, hindered them that were, and then he says, um, Pharisees began to urge him vehemently to pro provoke him to speak, laying wait for him, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. This is our loving Jesus. Right, to the humble, Jesus was as loving as can be. To the prideful, he was tough as nails. God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Right, like Andrew mentioned. And so the, when you approach God humbly, right, you fall in the stone and you're broken, but if you don't, the stone will fall on you and crush you. And we've only been preaching half of Jesus. Now, I believe that God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. We're the bride of Christ. And every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. And some are gonna choose the all others. They're gonna be liked and friend and follow each other and say, I don't care about the all others. All I care about is the one Jesus, right? And so this is the divine love story. And God is saying, okay, we're wrapping this thing up. And um, so I think in a sense, he's pulling back the curtain. 
and he's letting the evil show itself for all its ugliness. Satan worshiping clubs on high school campuses, Satan worshiping Grammys right in your face, Satan trans clothes designers for Target. I mean, it's, he's, God's letting it come out of the closet with all its ugliness and people are being bolder off for Jesus on the other side, right, with all their courage. And God's like, okay, we gotta wrap this thing up. Make your choice, God or the devil. And some people are going to be so used to going along, going along, going along that the devil will show itself and they're like, oh, I'm fine with it. Right? When a cell divides, some stuff goes to the right, some stuff goes to the left. Nothing's left in the middle. There are those that are doing evil and those that are silent in the face of evil. And by their silence, they're giving consent to evil. They're choosing their sides. And there's others that are saying, you know, I tolerated and was silent and when when they were doing something I didn't, get, didn't like, but, but then I was silent a little bit more and I still didn't, I didn't feel good about it. And then I stretched the rubber band and I even tolerated something that I really didn't feel good about, but I'm sorry, I can't go with hysterectomies on eight-year-old girls. They're still playing with dolls. They live half their day in an imagination world. All they want is acceptance of the authority figure, acceptance from their friends. And here is somebody that you can't even define a woman and you're wanting to say that you know that if this girl's a woman or not, or a boy or not, how do you even, you, you, you don't even have authority because you, here's a Supreme Court justice that can't even define a woman. And how are they in a position to decide this little three-year-old kid is not gonna be a boy, he's supposed to be a girl. And if churches can sit back, and so others are saying, I'm sorry, I can't be silent. When, and they cut the rubber band and it snaps back. And they say, you know what? Since I don't care about what other people think about me, I'm gonna be bolder for Jesus than ever before. And a dividing takes place, a split. And, um, and it's a difficult thing to do, but it's meant to be difficult because it's going to the very core of your being and it's separating people. In your heart, you're making the decision. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit as a discerner between the thoughts and intents of the heart. God is going into people's hearts and it's, it's, just, it's deciding, a division's taking place. Some people say, well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. He also knew Abraham's heart. But he wanted to see Abraham be willing to take his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah. You know, imagine a guy watching football and you go to him and say, hey, when was the last time you told your wife you love her? He's like, uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, okay. When was the last time you did anything to show your wife you love her? Uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, dude, we need to have a little talk. <laughs> it's like, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And he wants to hear some words out of your mouth and he wants to see some actions. I mean, even salvation is what? You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, right? It's gotta come out. And um, so, I'm gonna skip here to the last, here's one scripture. Um, Deuteronomy, before battle, the officer shall speak further and say, is anyone afraid and faint hearted? Let him go home. <laughs> so that his fellow soldiers will, uh, will, will not become disheartened too. In other words, everyone that's afraid, go home. <laughs> Right, we're, we're talking manhood, like Richard Harris talked about. We're talking, this is the day for people to stand up. If you're afraid, go home. We want people that have backbone, that love God and know that God loves them and God loves these little children. And um, anyway, so every generation has a crisis. I use this little illustration. Freshman chemistry class, teacher has a solution. Uh, pours in a catalyst, causes a reaction. Some stuff precipitates, gets to the bottom of the beaker. Other stuff gets effervescent and goes to the top. This is what the top every generation has a crisis. And we get through this crisis, there'll be another one, right? And so the, the time period we're living in is our solution in the beaker. The crisis of our time period is the catalyst is poured in and it causes a reaction. Some people's response to the crisis is to precipitate, to drop out, to run away, to hide, to think selfishly. And, and even like, like, I don't know how I'm gonna survive without the government, they take the mark of the beast. And other people's response to the same crisis is to get bolder. The early church, when they were persecuted, they prayed for boldness, right? Throughout history, it's Christians that would always step up in the crises. Bubonic plague, until the hung, it's like, okay, God, I'm already dead. My life is hid with Christ and God. Where do you need me? And um, anyway, so I'm going to end with, uh, I hadn't so much time, but it still gets away. Peter was with Jesus for, th for three years, he's around a fire, 
and a, group, a girl gets in his face and says, you are with Jesus. And you can just picture Peter looking around the fire and they're all eyeing him. And he says, I never met the guy. Like, that's it, Peter? You cave so fast? There is a real power, a fear of being rejected from a group. But after the resurrection, Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Sanhedrin said, we told you never to speak in his name again. And Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. Something happened to Peter. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he stood up to corrupt leaders. You know, I think maybe one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is standing up to corrupt government. Then we got King Josiah, his wicked grandfather Manasseh, uh, trashed the temple, was killing kids and sacrificing their blood to Moloch and um, uh, young Josiah. They found the scroll of the law. They read it to him. He rips his garments and repents. And then he the, uh, sends to the prophetess in town named Holda. And she says, tell the man that sends you the judgment's going to come, but not during his lifetime because he repented and we heard the words of the Lord. And so for the rest of the 31 year reign of Josiah, there's peace and prosperity in Judah. He sends the Levites out to teach the law during that revival. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get saved, to use that term. He tears down the Sodomite temples, even ones that Solomon had built. And then he has a huge Passover, bigger than anyone that ever been before. And God put off the judgment because he repented and sought the Lord. And, um, and then in the last thought is, you know, we talked about world history, but let's even back out even further. And there's the thought is, why did God even make us? You know, in 2003, they, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Spot was tiny, size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length from the night sky. Tiny spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that spot was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. It's the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And light travels in waves with blue being the shortest, fastest, red being the slowest, longest. They saw the red shift, which means these galaxies are moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. Now they have the James Webb telescope. You can see it even clearer. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18. It's a super gas giant. It's so large, if you were to place it in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all, and he made you. Amen. Why would he make you? What could you possibly offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing, except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So at some time in eternity past, it's almost like God said, been there, done that, I can make everything I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love by definition must be voluntary. So in the context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he intentionally created one little thing. He does not control your will. Now he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made it. It's different than everything else. And um, he doesn't need your love. He's not incomplete and your love somehow completes him. He doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back, but he'll never force you because the moment he would force you to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him and he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you, but he wants your love. Well, we're made in his image and What's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere near the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. Could it be that loving and being loved is important to God? Now, God loved everything he created. But the question is, could what he created love him back? All inanimate objects follow rules, laws of planetary motion, gravity, physics. Animals follow instinct. I looked at the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Never once is the word love used in any verse in the Bible to describe an angel's relationship with God. They worship God. They praise God. They glorify God. They smite his enemies like in Egypt and Jehoshaphat killing 180,000 you know, Assyrians. They um, 
word angel means messenger, so they deliver God's messages to Daniel and Ezekiel and the prophets and Mary. They're heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. They're ministering spirits under the heirs of salvation. They deliver Peter from Herod's jail and, and they rejoice when a sinner converts, but the word love is not used in any verse to describe an angel's relationship with God. They're not made in God's image and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. Angels cannot forgive. They are mighty beings, they are powerful beings, but they were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not mighty, we're not powerful. Like a king can have a castle with mighty soldiers and really smart staff, and then he has children. You look up in the Bible, the word love is used all throughout the Bible to describe men and women's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalms 91, because he said his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings uniquely created with the ability to love God back. But for love to be loved, it must be voluntary. He'll never force you because the moment he would force you, you would know he's forcing you. You know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. There's a, and then the, there's a whole other thing I don't have time to get into, but um, it's how can our free will, how can God create us with a free will yet still be in control? Well, God created light. Light is a photon, it's a perpendicular wave in the electromagnetic field traveling at 186,000 miles per second. God created light. Einstein's theory, theory of relativity is the closer you can travel approaching the speed of light, for you time slows down. If you could travel the speed of light, for you time would stand still. God created light, he's faster than light, so for God time stands still. We'll never comprehend that, but there is a verse in the Bible that says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Imagine experiencing a day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we are living in ultra slow motion compared to God. Why is this important, right? So God exists in the ever present now. I am that I am. When you're in God's presence, you can't think about the past, you can't think about the future, you can't even think, you're just experiencing. I'm in the presence of all power and all beauty and all love. So for God to create our reality, he had to create a space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. It's called the speed of causality, right? It's the fastest the two points of the universe can communicate in a vacuum. And if there wasn't the speed of light separating the, the cause from the effect, everything would happen now and the whole universe would collapse into an infinitesimally small spot, is what physicists say. So why is this important? We can make our little free will decisions, but we're moving so slow, God can readjust every electron in the universe so that his will is gonna take place. So it's our limited free will inside the context of his unlimited sovereign will. Does that make sense? Anyway, there's more I could say about that, but I'll get to the third point. The third point is God has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his universe creating omnipotent power, brighter than a trillion trillion suns, your response if you didn't melt would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet is dead. In the presence of all power in the universe, you would have an involuntary response. And God's like, I can do involuntary responses all eternity long. He is completely awesome. He says, I'm interested in this voluntary thing. So he has to hide himself behind his creation. I use the example, imagine if a billionaire has a son who goes to college, he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, gold rings, Rolex watch. He's gonna have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside and drives up in a clunker, he's got holes in his jeans, the uppity girls are gonna ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library and they eat together in the cafeteria and they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy, but she believes in him. They fall in love, they get engaged. And then one day he says, hey, I wanna take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff, right? If Jesus would have come in his glory, you'd have every political ladder climber, I'm your friend. No, he was born in a manger. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. So God creates us as free will beings, hides himself so that we have the opportunity to use our free will. But there's a third thing, he's just and he cannot help it, which means he has to judge every sin. If God does not judge a sin, by default, he would be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself, he ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not gonna get kicked out of heaven, and he is not gonna deny himself, and he is gonna judge every sin. So he could never be loved back. Because if he creates free will beings, 
And then he hides himself so that we can use our free will. But if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge our sin, like a wedding ceremony, if he's silent, you're giving consent. If he doesn't judge our sin, he's giving consent to sin. And if God gives consent to one sin one time, he denies himself. And he cannot deny himself, so he could never be loved back. Until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created the first electron. And the plan was his own son would become a man become the Lamb of God, and only as a man could God hang on a cross and die for our sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing Love, How Could It Be That Thou, My God, Shouldst Die For Me? So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's love in that he provided the Lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Abraham and Isaac going to the top of Mount Moriah. Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The Apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. In this hidden plan, Jesus became man, became the Lamb, and took the judgment for all of our sins. People say, well, God's just. There's one Jesus. There's billions of us. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How can, how can that balance? Jesus is divine. And he experienced judgment in a dimension we will never comprehend. It says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. You know, I've read through the book of Revelation hundreds of times, still trying to figure it out. But one thing seems clear. It's God that's pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation. Lamb breaks the seal. Angel throws the center. Angel pours out the vial. Why is that? Well, this is the final judgment. God's a just God. He has to judge every sin that he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was a sin back then and, and you were silent and not judging it. Were you giving consent to that? Is there a part of you that's unjust we didn't know about? Uh-uh. It says, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's gonna question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But that's the final judgment. He won't do any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross, experienced it as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, it's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally experienced the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. And he's the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb and he took the judgment of a just God upon himself. It says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to crush him. And then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. This way you and I can approach this universe creating, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-just God and not have to worry about being judged. Because all the judgment we deserve went on the Lamb and we're approaching God through the Lamb. The lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you, right? He can love you and you can love him back throughout all eternity and not have to worry about him judging you because all the judgment went on the lamb. It's like a mathematical equation. You have constants and variables. The constant is God is just. Was, is, and forever will be just. That will never change. The variable is who takes the judgment. You are a substitute. Jesus is our substitute. And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then the Holy Spirit reaches out through you to a lost and dying world to do what? To share the love of God clothe the naked, feed the hungry, rescue those unjustly sentenced to death, care for the little kids, what they're being taught, right? So instead of you doing good works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God through faith in the blood of the lamb. And then the Holy Spirit is reaching out through you to share the love of God to a lost and hurting world. There's nothing more exciting than letting the spirit of the living God use you to touch people's lives and draw them to Jesus. I'm gonna end with that. God bless you.